session, and we're starting with uh, David Schultz from Gatsby to we'll talk about uh, response liability of uh, V1 cells. Yes. I didn't, don't need a microphone. Excellent. Uh, actually, I think. Oh, no, I didn't want to bring my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I Wait, think you need it for the them. recording. Both of them. This one as well. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So. Today I will talk about um, the structure of population activity in uh, V1, and um, this, is, um, this is work done um, with Matteo Carandini. The data was gathered at his lab at UCL, who, um, and he's also jointly supervising me with Manish Sahani from the Gatsby. Um, and the outline of the talk will be, I will look at noise correlations in V1 and look at them as a function of contrast, the distance of cells in space, and the distance of those cells, cell pairs uh, as a, uh, in preferred orientation. And it will further look at uh, uh, differences between complex and simple cells in that setting. That will be the first part of my talk. In the second part of my talk, I will fit a generalized linear model, or I've fitted a generalized linear model to the spike data in V1. And um, I will look at the structure of the coupling kernels, which I will explain later, and see whether there are systematic differences between simple, simple and complex, complex cells uh, coupling. And I should also say that this is very much an ongoing analysis, so there remains to be a lot of things done, but I just wanted to share some um, observations rather than... So the, the general aim is to um, investigate non-stimulus-related covariability. So we would like to remove the stimulus-induced component. And in, you know, in, in general, one could think about inducing correlations between two, neur uh, two neurons by either having a direct connection, uh, maybe monosynaptically, or by two neurons sharing a, a common input source. And um, the sort of cartoon I will adopt for, for this data is we, we might have direct connections, uh, maybe between nearby cells, and we have a common input source, which is usually unobserved, and we have a visual stimulus. And I would just like to remove this, this stimulus-induced covariability. And I will to use these two approaches, the noise correlation approach and the GLM approach, to uh, perform this because they're not actually equivalent, so they might give me different results. Um, so just a brief motivation of why we would like to study noise correlations. Um, they constrain the space of hypothetical underlying circuitries, and they, also are, they are also relevant for decoding performances. Um, and you know, noise, I mean, correlations in itself are neither get bad nor good. They, they depend on the decoding algorithm and on their exact structure. Um, so this is the experimental setup. We um, record, we've recorded with a 10 by 10 Utah array in V1. This is a picture of it. And this is just, a, and the electrodes are 400 microns apart. Uh, this is an orientation preference map. And, um, the, and that was done in an anesthetized cat. And the, uh, the stimuli consisted of a sequence of flashed gratings, which you see down here. Each grating lasted 30 milliseconds. The entire sequence lasted 12 seconds and was repeat repeated 15 times. Eight orientations were, were employed, four spatial phases, which uh, yields, gives us 32 different stimuli. And this was done at four different contrasts. So zero contrast would be spontaneous activity, basically. Um, oh, interesting. Um, so this is not so important, but... <laughs> <laughs> This is basically uh, this is basically how I compute my noise correlations. This is two two equations. <laughs> this is, uh, should I fix them? I'm sorry for that. Um, so basic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, um, what I'm doing here is um, in 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 this in this approach, I bin my data, I bin my my spikes, and then I compute the uh, I compute the um, 
correlation across, across trials. So I have 15 <coughs> trials for each bin because each sequence was repeated 15 times. Perhaps you can write the equation on the yeah. one. Um, so if this is my spike count, uh, so basically the... <coughs> So the, uh, the correlation between, between neurons M and N is basically an average of an average. So the, this average inside refers to the spike count. So N is my spike count of neuron M um, at trial I, and I have 15 trials. And this is done at time T, whereas time T is my bin. It's just the way I split into bins. And then this is obviously because it's a it needs to be subtracted, the, the mean needs to be subtracted. So this mean refers to the mean at that time over these 15 trials. Um, so I have this. And then I have the corresponding expression for neuron N. And then I average, um, so obviously I average over trials, I, 1 to 15. Well, I'm, you can't probably see this. And then uh, obviously I, I divide by the variance of, um, so this is just the variance at that time t of neuron M. What do you mean by variance? Sorry? <coughs> N is the, the spike. What, what is sigma? Sigma is just the variance of the spike count at that time standard across. Deviation. Uh, sorry, the standard deviation, yeah. Um, and then what I do is I average this expression. So I, I average this, um, this ratio over my bins over time. That's right. Over and then I average over time. So that's my second method. My first method, I, basically because I have these um, sequences, which are repeated 15 times, I can just chunk them up any way I want. I don't need to care where the, but that's what I did at least. I didn't, uh, I didn't. But what is T? T is just the, the time bin. Relative to what? Relative to the start of the sequence, of the 12 second sequence. And I should say that these two methods give me similar results. Um, they, just, uh, they just vary in their noisiness because this estimate can be a bit noisy because you're dividing by a variance which can be very small. So, if you, so obviously these things can, can vary a lot as you average over them. And in the, and in the other case, uh, my bin size for this one is 70 milliseconds. 70, 70 milliseconds. And the, in, uh, in the other case, I, what I basically do is I define my bins by looking at, um, at the onset of a grating, so this is... Wait, and, and, and the number of trials here? 15. <laughs> um, yes, so, so every time there's a... So say, for example, I want to compute the noise calculation given the stimulus, because I need to uh, fix the stimulus, I just look at, the, I look at the time window, 30 to 100 milliseconds after that stimulus onset, and I regard this as a response of the neuron to that, um, to that stimulus. So do you have like on and off responses? No, no, in this, in this case it's, it's, it's basically just, often the neurons are very sharply tuned and they will be silent. They will be silent for uh, orientations they don't care for, but then when they, see an, uh, when they see an orientation they will spike. And that will happen usually uh, at a, with a minimum delay of 30 milliseconds. But that del delay is also contrast dependent. So for high contrast, you will have a short delay, something like 32 milliseconds. Yeah. For low contrast, it will be longer. So your bins correspond to two variables. Yes, yes. I, did, I also did it for the, the results don't really change um, so, if you so just consider so one. Your bin average of, so you, you capture part of the signal uh, variation here? Or? Um, because, because I have 15, because I, I keep my stimulus fixed, because at each point in time, I have 15 repetitions of that particular stimulus and the preceding stimuli. So everything up until time t has been shown 15 times, right? right so still, I'm sorry. The time bin? Yeah, oh, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, I also did it for just one stimulus, um, and it doesn't really change. The reason why, the reason why, why is because basically when there's, um, because there are 32 uh, um, stimuli, 
the neuron, if it's tuned for this orientation, it will be preceded by an orientation um, most often that it doesn't care for. So the response will actually just be reflect this one stimulus. Um, so what, what is your second measure for? Oh, well, my second measure is basically where um, I take the response for, now I look at each grating and I take the response, a response window of 30 to 100 milliseconds after the onset of each grating, and I regard that as a trial if it's the same grating. And then I average over all presentations of those gratings. So I have uh, thousands of those representations. So instead of I equals, instead of 15 trials, now I have 1,000 trials, say. And, and then I average over different gratings because now we are, we are swapping so of the averages. So that gives yes. The mean n, this one here, is just the mean over trials. No, in, but what is oh. the number? Oh, the number? You, you mean? In your experiment. Oh, in my experiment. Mm -hmm. um, it could, usually, the maximum is something like 40 hertz, if you divide by the. So usually, you have something on the order of three, two or three spikes, if, if, if the neuron pref prefers that stimulus, I mean, if it's not silent. The spontaneous rate is very low, often. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about this right now. Um, so this is just to show you how I represent my stimulus. Uh, this will be relevant for later on when I fit the GLM. It's basically just an indicator matrix where this is time, and then I have my orientations, and I stack my four phases, which I have on top of each other. Uh, and so if there was a grating of, of that orientation phase, there will be a one at that point in time. So this is just to show you how I... And yeah, regarding simple and complex cells, where well, I compute the F1, F0 ratio. And here again, I define the response as the, um, the spike count in a window of 30 to 100 milliseconds after the onset of a grating. That's how I define the response. And um, if we, so the F1, F0 ratio is, uh, the way I compute it is just the, the ratio of the powers of the phase modulation. And if we now plot a histogram, um, so first of all, it doesn't look bimodal, but um, if you look at the spike triggered average, so here I show you the, an example of a typical simple cell. It basically just responds to a particular phase. And this is an example of a complex cell which responds to four, all four phases. And um, yeah, and basically for, for, for the purpose of my, of my subsequent analysis, um, I just want to split the population into complex and simple cells. But what I really refer to is the most complex and the most simple cells. I mean. In absolute terms, they, they might not be simple cells, but within that population, just because I d define it to be in the middle or sort of split it to two quantiles, it's the, 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 com the more complex cells and the more simple cells, or the more phase modulated cells. Do you have any data on how this ratio compares to the usual ratio from different Yeah, the, the problem is um, often uh, um, these usual um, ratios are obtained by using drifting gratings. So you have a very uh, good estimate of the phase modulation, whereas in our case, we're just hammering the cortex with uh, gratings of 32 millisecond duration, so it's... But I mean, have you looked empirically at the relation between the two measures? No. No, I haven't looked at that. And basically, so uh, now if we look at the uh, structure of the noise correlations in the space and uh, orientation domain, so I should explain these matrices, this is basically the average noise... Sorry? The activity we call. Yeah. Do you have well separated spikes or is it multi-unit activity? No, it's single unit. Uh, so it's spike sorted activity. Um, and yeah, and we were very conservative on the, the spike sorting. So we only included clusters that were well separated from the noise cluster and where we sort of had confidence that it was a single unit, as far as you can have looking at the PCA space. Um, so, so this matrix is the, uh, indicates the average noise cross correlation between, two pair, uh, between a pair of neurons. And um, so each neuron obviously has a preferred, or most of them are well tuned, they have a preferred orientation. This is the difference in preferred orientation, um, going ranging from zero to 90 degrees. And this is their distance in space, ranging from zero millimeters to four. That was the extent of the uterine. And you see that if you now plot these average noise cross correlations, which were also average over contrast, that nearby cells, nearby cell, uh, so nearby cells with the same orientation tuning are highly noise correlated <laughs> compared to other cells. 
So we're talking the magnitude is something like 0 0.12. And as you go away in distance, as, as they become further and further apart, that drops smoothly. And you also get a drop in the orientation domain. So the more dissimilar tuned they are, the less the noise correlates correlation. And this was obtained from two cats. And it's quite similar to what Smith and Cohn found in macaque. Um, this is the number of pairs that went into this average. And so, uh, yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, this is basically just a control to, to show that we sort of sort of get similar results. Is, is your zero distance band really zero, or is it typically two adjacent electrodes? It's the it's the same electrode. Zero is the same electrode, and then the next biggest distance would be four hundred micron. But four hundred micron is the electrode band also. Where you have the um, yeah. So yeah, it would be, it's been so it, it will all be it will all be in the same bin. It is dominated, yeah, but you, I mean, sometimes you do indeed get two of them, yeah. And, and, and the stimulus, the size is such that it activates? It's a full screen grating, so it activates all. So there are no receptive field issues, okay, basically. So if you have two neurons, a pair of neurons with the same total orientation, in the, in the same and similar orientation columns, but are separated by strong millimeters, they're not correlated, or, or you have a statistical problem with them because they're very few pairs? Um, But this is not the. Oh, um, you you mean this this part here? Yeah, that's true. And I wouldn't trust those averages too much, and because we are lacking the statistical power. But I would. Uh, but these ones I would trust because we have a lot of pairs there. That's true. And now, um, now we're, if we look at the effect of contrast, what you see is contrast basically decorrelates neurons. Um, so down here you see the same plot I just showed you, but now split into different contrasts. And you see that uh, the main effect, so this is spontaneous activity, and that now, we are, now we are increasing the contrast up to 80%. And you see the main effect is that, that the noise um, cross-correlation in the orientation domain sort of disappears. This is the same scale. And this is just the average over the entire um, matrix. So you see this, this decline. Um, yeah. Is it really more correlated for the spontaneous activity, or is it just that the fine rate is low, so it's less uh, reliable? Um, uh, yeah, that might be the case. I mean, there are statistical issues, um, but it's it's not quite clear why why a low firing rate would result in more. Because you see less spikes, and you need more you need more tries to. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's not quite clear to me why a low firing rate would automatically result in more noise cross-correlation. And I mean, you also see this gradual sort of drop-off. So I mean, the structure is preserved as you increase contrast. But, uh, um, so now, um, if we split our population to the, according to this, chart, yeah. You said that you have like three, or two, three spikes in the preferred stimulus. Yes. So in, the type of that? Um, this is... No, th well, this was usually at 20 or 80 percent. 20 or 80 percent contrast. I mean, zero contrast. Uh, there's not much room to. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there are not there are not many spikes um, for zero contrast. That's right. Yeah, but I mean, there's still zero contrast. It, I mean, usually it's very low. It's maybe something like, if you look at the whole, it's maybe something like one hertz or half a hertz, maybe half a hertz, one hertz. It's very low. The spontaneous discharge. No, I haven't. I haven't yet. Uh, as I said, I've, I've not had the time to do that. So you, you also said that the latency changes. Yes, uh, at high contrast, your your sort of PST, if your your PSTH will peak quickly, and, and at low contrast, that will that will shift in time a bit yeah. and get smeared out a bit. Well, in this case, I, I chose my window to be quite large to capture the, the main response, so it's 30 to 100 milliseconds. So it will capture, in either case, it will capture most. So for high contrast, it will capture all of the response, and for low contrast, it will capture most of it. So. But I didn't want to confuse the analysis by having different si window sizes. Yeah. Did you check the correlation latency? No, I didn't do that. Because you're Yeah. Each waiting is only present for 32 milliseconds. 
That's right. So your window size is 32 to 100, and the latency difference could be 30 milliseconds on high um, The latency the difference? Latency difference the, oh, high the contrast and low contrast could, could be already 30 milliseconds. Um, yeah, I mean, I looked at the, the latencies, and they're usually in the range of, they are 30, they're usually like up to 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, is, it's not that much, basically. Yeah. Uh, yes, and the final factor drops with contrast. Okay, so now I split it into these uh, these two populations, simple, simple, and complex, complex cells, and I compare the noise cross correlation, and you see that complex, or the way I define complex cells, are more uh, noise correlated than than simple cells, um, especially across the orientation domain. Um, I have. So, and this is just the simple average of these plots. This is complex, complex, and this is simple, simple. And um, if we now look at the marginals, so here, so now I'm looking at the marginals uh, at for cells which are similarly tuned, and then where the distance is 40 to 50 um, degrees and 80 to 90. And as we just said, 80 to 90, I don't have a lot of data, but you can see that the impact of contrast on cells, so now I'm plotting it as a function of distance in cortex. And you see that the um, the noise cor cross the noise correlation that the, is modulated by contrast not a lot for similarly tuned cells. This is uh, these are simple simple pairs, and these are complex complex ones. But then, as you as you compare cells, as you look at cell pairs that have dissimilar orientation tuning, you see that for simple and especially for complex cells, contrast modulates their noise correlations quite strongly actually. So this is spontaneous activity, and this is eighty percent. This gradual decrease. And this is just a control to show the dependence of the firing rate to the F1, F0 ratio. And you see that there's, because you could imagine that complex cells fire more often, so the real, the real factor is firing rate rather than, rather than the F1, F0 modulation. But you see that there's, that there's little correlation. And if you look at um, the sampling of so you could imagine that maybe there's a sampling bias on the grid. So this is, again, orientation in space. You see that they are evenly sampled, simple and complex cells across the grid. The, and and this, these are pairs, obviously, because these are differences in, in space and orientation. So this, this sort of concludes the first part of the, of the um, analysis. And now I'm, um, I'm fitting the, the GLM model to the data. I mean, I'm not sure. I suppose many of you are familiar with it, and Michael is going to talk about it anyway, so I'm not going to go into details, but basically what the GLM does, it, it models the uh, intensity function of, of, of the neuron as basically um, by convolving the visual stimulus, which is our indicator matrix with the, with the filter, so this shouldn't be coupled, this should be visual stimulus, adding a sort of DC current, which is models sort of the spontaneous activity, and then uh, also injecting a post-spike filter which mimics things like refractory period or bursting, things like that. And then this sum gets pushed through a nonlinearity. And in my case, I chose the exponential because by using exponential, these components can be uh, interpreted as gain factors um, because basically, um, yeah, because they split into a product. Um, and this is the uncoupled model. So it has only uh, the visual filter and the post spike filter. But now what I did was I introduced coupling filters, and these coupling filters are basically um, filters that get convolved with the spike trains of the neurons which were recorded simultaneously. And the question we had was, does it add, can we predict, I mean, that wasn't the main question, but ultimately what we want, would like to know is, does that uh, improve our prediction of that particular neuron we're trying to model? Um, so, th so this is this term. And in subsequent plots, what I'm going to uh, show you is basically uh, this term exponentiated, so it's basically the, the gain factor, the, modulating, the modulation of the intensity function as a, as a function of uh, these coupling filters. And, and just to uh, quickly show, sort of illustrate that um, the coupling filters are not necessarily mapping to the noise correlation structure. You could imagine a GLM with coupling filters between A, B, and B, and C. Then A and C would be noise correlated, but if you used a, a GLM with the right nonlinearity, it would recover the coupling filters, but not this one here. The, it, would, it, would not, it would not indicate a coupling filter bin, between A and C. So it's, it's not just the same analysis I'm doing here. 
And this is basically what we get when we, um, so what I did was I had a pool of 40 neurons. I fitted each of them by coupling each of them in turn with the 39 other neurons. And then I averaged the coupling filters. So the coupling filters extend all the way to 8 milliseconds. I averaged them over, um, and in this plot I averaged them over orientation because each coupling filter is basically attached with a, a, a um, so I can interpret it as a, it's a pair basically of, of neurons which have a distance and a difference in preferred orientation. Something depends on time. Uh, yes, it depends on time. It's basically, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a convolution in time. That's necessary. Uh, necessary to, I mean, um, I mean, you could use, you could use instantaneous coupling, but, um, but I, uh, but uh, I've, I've, I mean, I've not systematically tried uh, instantaneous coupling and compared it with, with this one. So. This one here, yeah. yes. So you'd be unlikely to fix the one which uh, you yes, in this case, yeah. Well, I mean, if you if you look at it, there's 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 some some strong coupling right in the first bin, so that might be some instantaneous that's coupling. Common, that's not so common. It might you you might interpret this as common input indeed. Um, but now if you look at this, you, you see that across all contrasts, um, the, the coupling, the, and this is, so this basically is the gain factor, and the, the coupling uh, sets on at one point, sort of 1.7 milliseconds, with a delay almost, um, which would sort of argue against common input, but you never know, it depends on the exact circuitry. I mean, I wouldn't want to make any big conclusions about this. So if you simulate the whole model, like you said, you know, take your GNF and then push it? Yeah, in this case, I'm not simulating the whole model. I'm, I'm freezing the spike chains of the other neurons. So conditioned on the spike chains of the other neurons, I, I, I draw data. Have you, you've not tried doing the whole thing? Not yet, no. Right, no, that's something I want to do, I mean, as soon as possible. And now if you, if you basically average over, over space and look at the orientation structure of these coupling filters, you sort of see, again... Um, you see that uh, nearby cells are more strongly coupled than um, cells with similar tuning are more strongly coupled than cells with dissimilar tuning. Um, uh, yeah, but the but the, the and, and you also see this onset at 1.7 milliseconds, but it's the structure is less clean than, than up here. Um, and and now what I'm doing is uh, because there are these confounds, because I'm, I'm averaging over space and orientation. So now I'm, I'm uh, taking slices in time. And I'm looking at the orientation and the space domain at different points in time. So this is 1.7 to 2.5 milliseconds, for example, of the coupling filter. And you see that, um, and now I'm restricting it to simple, simple pairs. So I'm just looking at simple cells that are coupled to other simple cells. And I look at the structure of these coupling terms. And you see that um, the GLM model, basically, what it spits out is it says nearby cells with the same, with similar orientation tuning are strongly coupled. Um, and then as time progresses, this coupling goes to uh, zero. Uh, I mean, the, the game factor goes to one, basically. So the coupling has no effect on the, on the probability of a spike. Um, so this is the same color scheme that, uh, down goes. And you see this holds for different contrasts. So it, it's consistent across contrasts. Um, but now if you look at complex cells, so, so those were the simple ones here. And now at complex cells, and so I'm just looking at complex, complex pairs, you see that the GLM estimate says Cells which are, so it couples cells across all orientations, as you can see here. Um, and so basically the main difference here is that the, the, the complex, complex cells are just coupled across their whole um, orientation domain. Is it real that some 0 to 20 degrees has less coupling than the rest, or is that just a Um No, I, I would say this is, I mean, this, you, you mean this one here? This, yeah. this part, yeah, yeah. It, um, yeah. This is this is real. This so is real. More That's right. Yeah, it peaks. It peaks for something at so it peaks for a difference of preferred orientation at around sixty degrees. Um, that's that's what I found across across contrasts and <laughs> and even. That's right. Well, yeah. it's zero in this case. Um, it, it's sort of it's. it's it's, it's hard to tell, but it's, it's, not, it's not zero everywhere. I mean, here, for example, at low contrast, it's not zero. That's a very, that, that means all these, you have all these nonlinear effects, right? You have mm -hmm. the self-kernel, the factory theory kernel, mm -hmm. the series kernel. Is that the one which 
trust and put it back in this company because of the trust is so bad. That's right, yeah. That's right. So the difference I should say before you the difference between this and this plot is I just rescale the color. So here you have just one common scale and you see how the coupling decays, but if you're interested in the fine structure here, I just rescale so you see that it's it's it's, it's consistent across time. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, so it does, I mean, I don't have any slides, but I, I um, it does, um, I looked at the, um, sorry, I, I looked at the cross-validated, I just briefly looked at the cross-validated likelihood, and it seems to be the case that the coupled GLM does better in sort of 50% of the cases, and the uncoupled in the other, um, which is, I mean, which is still pretty good for the coupled model because it has many more parameters than the uncoupled model because you can imagine when I'm using four basis functions for each coupling and I couple to 14 neurons, I have 160 more parameters. And, and it's pretty unfair sort of in, in cross-validation terms for a much more complex model to compete because usually the simpler model will prevail. So, but I've not looked at it systematically. Yeah, because the... Yeah, that's one of the, the other things we would like to do. I mean, we'd like to recode the coupling um, filters because now we sort of have an idea about their structure and, and then we can reduce the parameter space. Um, and then finally, what I would just like to show you is if I now look at the coupling with across classes, simple complex, complex simple, then you find that the coupling is much weaker. Um, so here, here we have the simple simple coupling and you, you see it peaks here. Uh, the gain factor is sort of eight. And complex complex picks here, and the gain factor again is eight. But now, if you look at the simple complex or complex is simple, the gain factor. First of all, the structure is completely different, and um, and it peaks around three, so it's much weaker. And that might argue for the fact that they are participating in different networks. But I mean, those conclusions are very tentative. Um, so this is my this is my summary. So noise correlations follow smoothly with distance in space and preferred orientation that we sort of knew before from Coleman Smith. And contrast decorrelates units, that's sort of what we expected as well. Um, pairs of complex cells are more noise correlated than pairs of simple cells. And then um, in the second part, we find that the, these average GLM coupling filters prefer to uh, have a delay of 1.7 milliseconds, that the coupling falls off smoothly in space, um, and that when we look at simple, simple cells, the coupling, <coughs> um, the coupling decreases monotonically with distance and preferred orientation and is uh, so excitatory for similarly tuned neurons and inhibitory once they are very dissimilarly tuned. In between, the gain factor is usually one, so the model doesn't modulate it. And if you look at complex, complex cells, then you find that the excitatory coupling peaks at 60 degrees difference in preferred orientation and falls symmetrically falls off symmetrically around that mean. And then finally, we find that interclass coupling is significantly weaker than intraclass coupling. So, I just want to understand the meaning of this complex. So you're, mm -hmm. you're trying to model one neuron spike train given all the other spike trains. That's right. And so then you're, you're saying that one neuron spike train is going to do its filter on the stimulus mm -hmm. and, its, its, uh, and its coupling from all the other spikes. That's right. Yeah, so there's one thing you can, you can, so once you have your estimate, you can look at the Hessian around it. You can look at the, the sort of the Hessian. And if two parameters are trading off, you will have some sort of ridge because your likelihood won't change. And what I've observed is that usually you, you don't get any ridges. So the Hessian is, it's, it's well peaked, basically, the likelihood. So I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure how that trade-off would work in, in that context. But obviously, I have to look at that more closely. Mm-hmm. 
the, with the time delay. Yeah, but not, not a large damage. I don't know if it's yeah so, so uh, are you referring to... Uh, like the, the small bumps on yes. the bottom. No. Oh, this one here. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's a bit tempting, right? Because if you, if you divide the time delay of, say, 4 milliseconds by the distance, 4 millimeters, you get something like 1 millimeter per millisecond, which is sort of uh, physiological. I mean, it's, it's not an absurd speed. Um, but again, because, of the, because we haven't done all of the, we haven't completed the statistical analysis, so we're not quite sure how, relevant, how significant this little bump is. So I, I would be very cautious in interpreting that. Yeah. So how much uh, the cell variability was captured by this um, uh, So we haven't looked at that yet, because we just, we've just completed the fitting of the model, and we haven't looked at how well it does in predicting spikes and the responses. When you vary the phase, um, we no, we haven't looked at that yet. Mm -hmm. Do we have an intuition why the complex complex correlations uh, fall off monotonically with, uh, with distance in our spatial space and interaction in the coupling is not? Yeah, the, uh, that's a good question, and um, and to be quite honest, I don't have an intuition for that. Um, um, so you do that. That's right. It does show us what is the pattern of connection Yeah, I, I, I fit it to the, all the other neurons, but then I just show you when I show complex complex, I just take a subset of these coupling filters and I just show you. Okay. So, uh, so I'm, I'm back to my question. Then you should expect that it should reflect to some extent in some monotonic or nonlinear fashion the correlation of cells. So yes, but the question, start. yeah, the question is this nonlinear fashion. What's the transformation between, what's the mapping between yeah. noise correlations? Um, yes, that is surprising, yeah. Um, so you don't have any? I, I don't. Well, I mean, no, I don't. Um, one, thing, one thing that is sort of consistent is if can you... It be, can it be the delay um, that the is captured by the interactions and not by the by, by correlations? But it goes into spike now? Um, so if you... Um, if you remember these noise correlation plots, you saw that the noise correlation for complex-complex pairs in the orientation domain is stronger than for simple-simple pairs. And if you look at the if you look at the GLM coupling filters, this is simple-simple. It's sort of pretty tight in the orientation domain, right? And and this is sort of yeah. But now, if you compare it to complex-complex, the GLM assigns more gain across the orientation domain um, as compared to the simple-simple. And you could maybe think of that as a reflection of the change in the noise correlation. Reflect, because, because basically what the noise correlation is, is telling us is there's more noise correlation between, or across the orientation domains for complex, complex cells as compared to simple, simple cells. And what the GLM is telling us is there's more coupling across the orientation domain for complex, complex pairs as opposed to simple, simple pairs. So, I mean, that's... So, so this would suggest that if you just took complex cells Yes. It would change. It would, it, would, it, would, it would be like the correlation. It would, yeah, I mean, I've not done that, but that would be a control, yeah, exactly, just uh, to focus on the... I have, I have a more general question. Uh, uh -huh. What is your view uh, about the recent uh, claims in uh, the science paper about all these islamic types? Um, so correlations in complex, in uh, Right. So I think there are quite a few factors that can, that can sort of distort your measure of noise correlations. One, for example, is often you don't know which layer you're in, right? So you shoot a Utah array, you don't know which layer you're in. You could be in layer four, you could be in layer two, three. And that might depend, it might be layer specific. That's, for example, an argument Smith and Cohen have, have brought forward as a response to this Tolia's paper that says noise correlations are really small. I mean, our results are sort of point towards that paper more because they reported things on the order of 0.05, and we have 0.08, 0.04. Um, and but we have many strong correlations, like uh, 1 or 0.2. Some, some of the correlations. 
So, some of them. I mean, if you average over them, that's what they, they only report averages. I mean, we have the luxury, because we have so much data, to actually uh, split it up into the structure. But if you average over it, it's sort of similar. Um, but then, yeah, it depend I think the one of the main... And then you use different stimuli, and it's, it might be stimulus, depend. It's, yeah, anesthesia, this was urethane. Um, you, you might have up and down states. So one of the other things we want to look at is what's the, we want to further uh, split the variability, covariability into components. And another component we want to look at is up and down states. And they are quite prominent. So if we just focus on up states and down states. You can see it from the alone. Yeah, you can see it. You, you have the whole array and you have the grid and you see how all neurons sort of turn on at the same time. It's quite impressive. And then you have the LFP as well. The Sorry? Oh, okay. Regardless of the stimulus. They turn on more. Yeah, they're more active than they should be. And now we're trying to sort of split into up and down states and, and do, redo this analysis and see, see if our noise correlations drop further. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. I, I just have an acknowledgement. So, uh, yeah, so Matteo, Manish, Jonathan Pillow helped me with the GLM. And then these Andrea Benucci, Laura Gustin, Stefan Katzner, they recorded the, the data. Thank you.